Dobar dan svima, vaša ekscelencija gospodine Arjo, uvaženi rektor Univerziteta u Sarajevu, profesore Špijer, uvaženi ministre utrašnjih poslova, gospodine Katica, vaše ekscelencije, poštovani predstavnici, od svih drugih prisutnih organizacija, cijenjene kolekce, kolege, dekani, profesori i studenti, dragi gosti. Dobrodošli na današnje predavanje, gostujuće predavanje našeg počasnog predavača, gospodina ambasadora Diega Arije, čije iskustvo i stručno zdaju nezamijeni uvid u dešavanje na ovim prostorima 90. godina prošlog stoljeća. U ime organizatora želim da se zahvalim našim počasnom gostu, što je prihvatio poziv da bude s nama danas. Njegova posvećenost i angažiranost u borbi da se osigura da genoci i drugi oblici spločina protiv čovječnosti i međunarodnog prava ne bi i dalje razarali međunarodni poredak. Nemjeljivije doprinos gospodina ambasadora sigurno i boljoj budućnosti ne samo Bosni i Hercegovine, nego čovječanstva. Još jednom se zahvaljujem gospodinu ambasadoru i u nastavku ću kratko to sve reći na engleskom jeziku i daću riječ našem uvaženom rektoru, nakon toga gospodinu Petanu, našem fakultetu, prosim Adiću i nakon toga ćemo imati odlaganje našeg uvaženog gosta, ambasadora Diega Arije. Your Excellency, Mr. Arya, esteemed Director of the University of Sarajevo, Professor Strijen, esteemed Minister of Internal Affairs of Sarajevo Canton, Mr. Katica, dear colleagues, deans, professors and students, dear guests. Welcome to today's guest lecture, where we have the privilege of engaging in a conversation with our esteemed guest of honor. His experience and expertise provide inevitable insight into the events that took place in this region during the 1990s. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to express our deep gratitude to our distinguished guests for accepting our invitation to join us today. His unwavering commitment and dedication to the fight against genocide and other forms of crimes against humanity and international law have made an immeasurable contribution to creating a safer and better future, not only for Bosnia and Herzegovina, but for all humanity. Once again, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to Ambassador Area for gracing us with his presence at this lecture. Now, I would like to pass the floor to our esteemed director, Professor Škrije. Gospodin Škrije, izvolite nošte sa nas u kultu. Vaše ekscelencijo, ambasadori Arija, vaše ekscelencije, ambasadori i predstavnici ambasada u Kastu Hercegovini, poštovana gospodo Đosić iz parlamentarne skupštine Kastu Hercegovine, poštovani gospodine Hođić iz ministarstva vanjskih poslova Kastu Hercegovine, poštovani doktor Velić iz pravobranu našta Kastu Hercegovine, poštovana sutkine, Senjan iz Ustavnog suda Federacije Kosti i Hercegovine, poštovani gospodine ministre, iako ga ne vidimo ovdje, ali ga želim pozdraviti, možda nam se pridruži Katica, postavljam naše dekane, uvaženog kolegu Sejada Tučao, dekana Fakulteta političkih nauka i dekanesu Pravnog fakulteta Univerzitetu Sarajevo profesoricu Zinku Grgo, predstavnici i predstavnice organizacija civilnog društva, poštovani profesori i profesorice, uvažene studentice i studenti, dame i gospode. Povod za naše današnje okupljanje je izuzetno važna prilika da poželimo dobrodošnicu u uglednom gostu i poznatom diplomati Diego Ari na Univerzitetu Sarajevo. Prisutstvo gospodina Arije među nama je svedočanstvo značaja koji pridajemo dijalogu i njegovanju razumijevanja i učenju od istaknutih pojedinaca koji su dali veliki doprinos na polju međunarodne diplomatije. Tokom svoje karijere, kao što je svima u Bosni uglavnom poznato, gospodin ambasador Arije je pokazao duboku posvećenost za laganju za mir, 
pravdu i zaštitu ljudskih prava. Jedan od dokaza je i izvještaj gospodina ambasadora Arije iz 1993. godine pred Vijećem sigurnosti Ujedinjenih nacija koji je rasvijetljuju ratne zločine koji su počinjeni u Bosni i Hercegovini. Njegov izvještaj koji je hrabro dokumentovao sistematsko etničko očišćenje, logore, masovna ubijstva i silovanje, odigrao je ključnu ulogu u podizanju globalne svijesti i pozivanju na odlučnu akciju u Bosni i Hercegovini. Nepokolebljiva pozicija njegove ekscelencije ambasadora Arije prema Bosni i Hercegovini koji je obilježila snažna osuda zločina i zagovaranje humanitarne intervencije još uvijek duboko odjekuje u našoj univerzitetskoj akademijskoj zajednici. Razmišljajući o izazovima sa kojima smo se suočili u Bosni i Hercegovini, prepoznajemo važnost pojedinca kao što je njegova ekscelencija ambasador Arija, koji su se pojedinaca, izvinjam se, koji su se neumorno borili za pravdu, mir i zaštu nevinih žutava. Današnje gostujuće predavanje predstavlja izuzetnu priliku za sve nas da uživo probudimo svoje razmišljanje o globalnim procesima, steknemo nove perspektive i ponudimo svoj doprinos u diskusijama vezanim za ovu oblast. Sve ovo činimo uvjereni da upravo takva razmjena znanja može voditi ka njegovanju kulture, empatije, tolerancije, jedinstva, a sve ukupno težeći miru i prosperitetu ljudskog roda. Ohrabrujem aktivno učešće prisutnih u ovom predavanju i afirmaciju Univerzitetu u Sarajevu kao prostora za kritičko razmišljanje i unapređenje znanja. Koristim priliku da se zahvalim Fakultetu za kriminalistiku, kriminologiju i sigurnostne studije, kao i dekanu Jasminu Ahniću na iskazanoj inicijativi i organizaciji ovog predavanja, koga također srdečno pozdravljam kao domaćina ovog današnjeg skupa. Još jednom izražavam najtopiju dobrodošnicu njegovoj ekscelenciji Diego Ari, našem uvaženom gostu i nakon promocije knjige Usporeni genocid koja se sinoć održala, koja je održana u Vijećnici, mogu kazati prijatelju Bosne i Hercegovine i prijatelju Univerziteta u Sarajevu. Na kraju završio bih svoje obraćanje za hvalnošću svima ova na pažnji u srdačan pozdrav dekanici pravnog fakulteta Univerziteta Zemci koja nam se među vremenu pridružuje. Hvala vam na pažnji. Hvala lijepa, prosvrce Sarković, sve vas lijepo pozdravljam i evo, danas mi je izvjetna čast da imam mogućnost da se obratim njegovoj ekscelenciji, ambasadoru Ariji, te uvaženi rektor Universiteta u Sarajevu, profesor Škije, poštovani ministar unutrašnjih poslova koji nadamo se da će nam se pridružiti, kantona Sarajeva, gospodine Karca, vaše ekscelencije, poštovani predstavnici Viječa kongresa, vršnjačkih intelektualaca, cijeljene kolege, dekani, dekanese, profesori, profesorice, studenti, studence, dragi gosti. Čini mi izvjetno čas da vas kao dekan Universiteta u Sarajevu, Fakulteta za kriminalistiku, kriminologiju i sigurnostne studije, mogu pozdraviti u povodu jedne izuzetno važne posjeti našem fakultetu. Naime, naš uvaženi gost je njegova ekscelencija Diego Arija, bivši ambasador Venezuele u Ujedinjenim nacijama i predsjedavajući i član Vijeća sigurnosti Ujedinjenih nacija u periodu 1992. i 1993. godine. U najtežim danima za Bosnu i Hercegovinu najteže je bilo imati prijatelje u svijetu. To me i danas ono što je nesporna činjenica jeste da je jedan od rijetkih istinskih prijatelja naše države bio i ostao uvaženi ambasador Arija, autor knjige Usporeni genocid iz Bosne. Ambasador Arija je počasni Sarajlja, počasni gost Univerziteta u Sarajevu, 
i sada počestni gost našeg fakulteta. Zahvaljujem se njegovoj ekscelenciji, što su upravo studenti Fakulteta za kriminalistiku, kriminologiju i sigurnosne studije, te akademsko osoblje, nakon prilici da nakon promocije koje smo imali juče, čuju predavanje uvaženog ambasadora na našem fakultetu. Znam da smo svi mi koji smo jučer pristovali promoci knjige dugo bili, a zasigurno smo i još uvijek pod posebnim utiscima, emocijama, spoznajama. Vjerovatno da do ovih namara uvaženog ambasadora Arije nismo ni bili u cijelosti svjesni njegove uloge u događajima na međunarodnom planu, ali i u samoj Bosni i Hercegovini tokom prvih godina agresije na našu državu, a posebno kako to ističe Bernard Henri Levy, koliko je onih koji mu duguju svoj život. Ohrabren sam i uzbuđen što će naši student, mladi ljudi koji će sutra voditi i razvijati dalje državu Bosnu i Hercegovinu, danas iz prve ruke čuti šta su to bili nečuveni dvostupki standardi vječa sigurnosti u jedine i nacija, ali i vlada evropskih država kada je pitanje naša zemlja, te kako je takav odnos prema agresiji na Bosnu i Hercegovinu zapravo napravio sa učestnicima agresije. Ambasador Arija nema dilema kada to tvrdi. On također tvrdi da je nesporna realnost, da je još od nacita prvog mirovnog plana 1992. godine do Dejtonskog porazuma temeljno pitanje iza političkog sukova, neprijateljstava i pregovora bila etnička podjela Bosne i Hercegovine i kako spriječiti da nije narod dominantno muslimanski stvori državu u Srpsku. Čini mi se da su nam danas više nego ikada potrebna ovakva sjedočanstva direktnih sudionika događaja koji se obilježili u naše živote, kako bismo bolje i jasnije razumjeli i današnju poziciju naše države u Evropi i svijetu. Veliko hvala uvaženoj kolegici profesorci Ladi Sarković, Budaka Nesa za naučno istraživački rad Fakulteta za kriminalistiku, kriminologiju i sigurnostne studije, kao i drugim članoma Vijeća kongresa bošnjačkih intelektualaca, koji su omogućili da ambasador Arija bude naš današnji sredovač. Vaša ekscelencijo, još jednom vam se zahvaljujem na ukazanoj časti i pozivam vas da se obratite našim studentima, profesorima, dragi gosti. I cannot speak here, but I might have to suffer my words in English. Thank you so very much for all the professors, students, I feel very proud to be sitting next to the rector of this great university, with Ada, with Lada, and the dean of this school, uh, which didn't exist 30 years ago, and is only history. I thought that uh, I would like to think aloud with you. I hope that at the end I may have the opportunity to reply to some questions. You know, I, the first time I came to the city it was on April 23rd, 1993. It was not as nice as it is today. That I saw the streets full of automobiles and life around me. I enter in an armor car of the United Nations, protected. I was heading the mission to the Serenitsa, and I was heading the United Nations Security Council mission to an enclave. And uh, there were no, not even a dog in the streets. We were fire in many places. I don't have to tell the ones who suffer to repeat what can of experience. Do you hear me? Yes, on, yeah. Okay, okay. I would like to speak to you today 
I said, no, no, already see this on the <coughs> level, which was made two years ago, which uh, allowed me, I believe, to be as frank as I can on the, not only on past issues, but present issues. But even before I became an honorary citizen of Sarajevo, the Le Monde, the French paper, when, uh, when he, they mentioned me, they called me Don Diego de Sarajevo. <laughs> Kofi Annan, the Secretary General, followed that. And why would they say that? Because I was one of the very few defenders at the time of the plight, uh, the tragedy, and the people in this country. Recently, thanks to the Council uh, of Congress of Bosnian intellectuals, they have translated my book, which uh, in Bosnia they call it Slow Motion Genocide, which is precisely what I said in Severnica in April 1993. And thanks to them, the book is now in Bosnia. Originally, I wrote it in Spanish, then it was translated into English. And finally, thanks to this organization in Bosnia. My book is dedicated to the young people of this nation. Because I believe that the most fine inspiration for the future of the courage of the people who actually didn't make it and who suffered so much for so many years. And I believe it's the duty of the present generation to see how to inspire and make the young people in this country to understand that there is a future. This country was not as a permanent member of the Security Council thought. It was not created by Tito. It's amazing. So people in the Security Council thought that Bosnia was created by Tito. And do not know the, history, the great history of more than a thousand years of what Bosnia and Herzegovina is. This book has only one value. It's the independent truth of things which I was not told about, in which I participated very actively as a member of the United Nations Security Council. People in my country, Venezuela, who write yesterday politician, what is Diego doing in a place called Bosnia? Defending something that we call the Muslims. People felt that there was something away from their own interest. I wanted to prove to the international community that in human rights, you must be daltonic. It means that you don't differentiate people uh, by colors, and that human, human rights defense is only the essence of that, no longer that. I never seen, in the time that I was at the United Nations, it, it was, uh, I believe, the biggest cover up and complicity of the international community to hide what was happening here. When I came to Severnica in 1993, 23 of April, I could tell you my impressions minute by minute of the time that I was there. I never in my life see people starving in the streets and dying. Last night, at the presentation of the book, I said that when you enter the Security Council closed room, which is called informal consultations, you see a paper in front of you that tells you, for example, yesterday, at 15 hours, this is on perform reporting, Serbian borders killed 12 children. They were playing soccer in the backyard of school. But you don't hear the screams, you don't see the blood, you don't hear the desperation of the parents. You are far away. You are in a great building in New York. And that's why the Pakistani ambassador and myself, 
we force the Security Council to send a mission of ambassadors to Bosnia and Herzegovina, to Croatia, and to Belgrade. Because we wanted to know exactly what was happening. And I said last night that not even 15 minutes has passed since I arrived here to realize that we have been lying for six months about the plight of the terrible situation of not only of Serenica, but in Bosnia in general. Then I discovered that that was a reason that, that there were no UN missions to a theater of war before. This was the first time in the United Nations history that that happened because the international community didn't want to inform the world what was really happening. To give you an example, the Red Cross representative at the time here wrote in his report the following. The members of the mission led by Ambassador Arya were shedding crocodile tears of what they saw in Serenitsa, where nothing is happening. It's only the excess of population. And they have exaggerated the situation. When you read that a representative of one of the most prestigious organizations in the world who tried to cover up what's happening here, you can imagine what the military and the UNPRO form did during this war. The, the fate of what happened here was sentenced, if I could use a legal term, in 1992. Only a few months after this country was recognized as a member of the United Nations. I had the opportunity to raise my arm to vote for the admission of Boston. But that joy lasted very little. Less than two months afterwards, the international community and basically the European Union, Lord Carrington and Banks at the time, already had a map dividing in three the new member of the United Nations the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I said many times that South Africa's apartheid was not created by the international community. It was created by the Boers. But in Bosnia and Herzegovina, apartheid was created by the international community and imposed by the United Nations. In today, the only country in the world where apartheid is living and kicking, is very much alive, is here. I've come to the conclusion that the international community have used this country as a laboratory of experiments, especially institutional state, institutional arrangements that are so complicated that it maybe prevents Bosnia from having the future that they deserve. I go further, I believe that Bosnia is not anymore a free country. That Bosnia is not a sovereign country. I voted to admit a sovereign free country of the United Nations. Today, I see a sort of neo-colonialism in which you have like a viceroy, like a British viceroy in India, which is the high representative, which is on top of all the Bosnian institutions. There's nowhere in the world where that system is prolonged. And I believe, using my right as a citizen of Sarajevo, that it is not only shameful, I think it's an insult to the dignity of the people of this country. There are, there are no books on what really transpired 
in the Security Council during those years. Why? Because, as I said, people didn't want you to know. Actually, when I entered Srebrenica with five other ambassadors, Russia, France, Pakistan, New Zealand, and Hungary, the UNPRO four forces took the cameras from my colleagues so they would not take photographs of what's happening in Srebrenica. You, you will find that, I'm sure, incredible. I refused to deny. I was the head of the mission. And the only pictures that came out, I gave them to Reuters when they were published about Srebrenica. The UN had a camera, the baby was taking the, the camera films. That film was never available to anyone, except when I went to be a witness against Milosevic at The Hague, that uh, they projected uh, a very short part of our stay in Serenity. The the stress that uh, a few countries felt and the frustration, the impotence to see what was really happening here was really bad, which we, we discovered in our, in our prison, uh, and that, that will become difficult for the others to accept or to believe. I wrote in our report, coming back to the York, Something that I said in Serenity. I said, slow motion genocide is taking place here. The Grand Mufti, two years ago, here in Sarajevo, asked me why did I use the term genocide. And I said, it was such an abominable, horrendous situation that I couldn't find any other term. But of course, I'm sure the only professors know that genocide is to use it is almost a sinful thing to do with the United Nations. Because the term genocide obligates for some action. And of course, nobody wanted to take action. <coughs> At the time that I'm referring to, we had only two countries under sanctions. Iraq for invading Kuwait, rightly so, and Gaddafi's Libya for, for bringing down the Pan-American plane on local. So two Muslim countries, only two, and there were Muslims were on the sanctions. Then, when a country where Muslims <coughs> were a very significant part of the population, happened here in Bosnia. The international community did not send half a million people like they did to Kuwait. Kuwait had oil. Did not send bombers to Libya. We send them blankets, medicines, food when we could. Because the United Nations military, or UNPRO, which means United Nations Protection Forces. We're not protecting anybody. And we're being, I would say, bad witnesses in many cases for not reporting the real truth of what's happening. A few years ago, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court for former Yugoslavia, Del Ponte, Mr. Del Ponte, called me and asked me if I could be a witness in the case of Milosevic. And I said, yes, but why don't you ask the main, the main countries? And she said to me, because they argued that they could not anticipate the massacre of what happened in Srebrenica. And I said, well, they are lying. And she said, yes, we read your speeches, we saw your videos, and you have been reporting for more than a year in the Security Council that this will happen. So I had this unique opportunity 
I was the only member of the Security Council that was willing to be a witness. I was a witness also to the position against Karashik. And I was a witness in the defense of Nasser Orich in the case of Sobrenza. Why was I the only one? Because the other ones would not be in a position to tell the truth because they had too many things to cover up because actually this is what happened. There was a, the collection of covering up of what happened is what I tried to, in a way, to discover in this book which now is published in, in Boston. I learned, I, I, I didn't know anything about Bosnia before 1990. I assure you that I know a lot about Bosnia today. And uh, that has increased my admiration, my respect, and my love for many people. And uh, I was telling this morning to the director that I believe there is a moral obligation of the citizens to not forget what happened here, that the death of so many people, so many disgraces, will not be in vain, but on the contrary, it will be the basis, the source for inspiration for the new generation to come up that didn't suffer that directly, but they did suffer indirectly to the families. I, I believe that the, the, this university, and again, I said to the rector, has a fundamental responsibility, which is not to allow to forget what happened here. What happened here originated Ukraine invasion by Putin. Why? Because Putin learned, and the Russian learned, at the beginning of the war here, that the international community will not lift their finger seriously to stop anyone. And that's how Crimea happened, and that's how Ukraine happened. Nobody should know the name of Srebrenica. There is no justification for that, because this war should have never been accomplished if Milosevic had been stopped in 19, December 1990 when he bombarded Dubrovnik. That was the time to stop him. One of the member, permanent members of the Security Council, I had a discussion with him on a bilateral basis, and I said, I said to him, you know that what I'm telling you, what's happening there, is the truth. I said, yes, Diego. But we cannot afford the risk of having a Muslim power <coughs> emerging in Europe. And so, which Muslim power? Because Sarajevo is the most ecumenical city problem in Europe, multi-ethnic, multinational, multi-religious. But that sense, which is absolutely false, that an suddenly a Muslim country was emerging, closing eyes to Europeans' behavior and tinted the issue as a Muslim issue. So much so that in the resolutions of the Security Council, at the beginning they would say the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina side, it was changed to the Muslim side. Suddenly this Republic became a Muslim side. And that tinted since that day to today, the image of Bosnia International. And uh, I believe that that was really a crime. Uh, the United Nations wanted and the main countries to forget that according to the Charter of the United Nations, an invasion, of, uh, an army invasion of another country should be actually confronted. But nobody wanted to confront that. And uh, I believe that uh, since 1992, already Bosnia had been sentenced by the international community actually to disappear. Why do I say that? We imposed, and I was a member of the council, an arms embargo 
I thought that that was wonderful. That a small country like mine would not know the real situation of the armament of these uh, countries is forgivable. But the main countries knew exactly well that there was only one party that was fully armed. There was Milosevic. And there was a second one, it was Croatia, with the support of the Germans. And there was one, disarmed, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So they thought, like Putin in Ukraine, this will last maybe a couple of weeks, and the Bosnia will be overrun, because I completely disarmed. <coughs> but the Bosnians did not follow the script. They were disrespectful and brought courage uh, and actually faced to a point that if they to an agreement had not been imposed on, on this country, Bosnia would have come victorious together with the Croats at the end when they were stopped when they were at the doors of Agaluka. They didn't want what they thought was a Muslim country to win the war. And they imposed something which was important at the time. It was to stop the war. I spoke many times to President Zemeckovich about this issue. To Ghanish, to Haris Elashi, to Kakerbe. Uh, I, I think I was the only one who was really have a personal relationship with the leader of this country. But I, I said to them, the only thing that cannot be changed, or should not be changed, is the Quran or the Ten Commandments, but not a NATO agreement. And even the people who prepared it thought it should be reviewed within 10 years. It hasn't been reviewed. And uh, bureaucracies in Berlin, they don't melt by themselves. Bureaucracies tend to grow. You will see that this office of the High Representative we grow in size, we grow in intervention. And I believe that uh, is the wrong course to follow uh, in the future of this country. I repeat what I said to you, Selector. This campus, this university, these professors, these students, are in front of them a great challenge, which is to celebrate that the people who sacrifice for you are extraordinary people. And the best that you can do for them is not to forget them, is to celebrate and actually look for something that they fought for. I met many people who died during the conflict. And those people, I can never forget, I stood in front of them in a school in Srebrenica in April, 93. And I said, here are six ambassadors of the United Nations Security Council. We represent the highest political power of the world. And we will protect them. We did not. That's why I wrote the book. Hello. I, I want to say hello <laughs> to Ambassador Heria. And this is also a very emotional moment for, for me because it's been a while since we've <laughs> met each other. I wanted to tell you how much I appreciate your work. And um, I'm, I always lack words when I need to say somebody that I appreciate their, their work and that looks... Um, but then again, 
I've dedicated almost a whole chapter of my book to the concept of slow motion uh, genocide. And um, I mentioned you in so many conferences. Um, as a reference. Uh, I, I, I think this is the opportunity for me to say that, you know, we know how much you did in terms of advocating for Bosnia and Herzegovina. I don't want to say the word lobbying because it's, you know, you did something uh, 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 really highly more moral. You advocated for Bosnia and Herzegovina during its worst time, but I know that you advocate for the cause of multicultural Bosnia and Herzegovina even <coughs> nowadays. Um, but, but you did a huge favor for the small community of Bosnian genocide scholars uh, because uh, your testimonies and, and uh, your work even before you published a book have somehow paved the way for us to argue more that uh, 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 slow motion genocide in Bosnia existed much before its full culmination in, in <laughs> Srebrenica in July 1995. So I wanted to ask you now that we live in the culture of denial and uh, nowadays I, I, I teach for the, for the past couple of years, I've been teaching at, at this faculty um, and uh, one of the subjects of my courses is about denial of genocide. And it's not easy in Bosnia and Herzegovina where half of the country, uh, because of its leadership and intellectual elites, uh, deny genocide. It's not easy to approach young people uh, with the full truth about what happened in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I wanted to ask you, what is your opinion about it? Uh, uh, how to really, uh, what is the best way to approach young people with the facts of genocide in Bosnia? Thank you. Uh, I will sit down so I can speak on the microphone. Okay. You don't know, but uh, I cannot enter my own country. I have an order of arrest in my country that has become a narco-military tyranny. To engage young people is a very difficult task if you engage them only with the past. The past is painful, difficult, and I don't think the people who are very young would like only to entertain that their mission is to touch about the past. That's what I mentioned that, uh, to the rector, that to inspire the new generation based on that unique asset, which is the history of this country, to try to inspire them for the future. And thus, I say you as a professor in general play a fundamental role. But if the present generation does not do enough, uh, I was telling the rector, for example, the Jewish people. It's not one day goes by and somewhere in the world they will not talk about the Holocaust. And they're right. People have not forgotten. It's been a long time since I hear what's happening in genocide, not only in Severanisa, in Bosnia. Okay, thank you. Zvolite. <coughs> Uh, Professor Sotic is a member of our faculty. Professor Sotic, Izvolite. Thank you. I would like to say hello our guests, friends and colleagues. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, greet our distinguished guest. His Excellency uh, Ambassador Diego Aria, his true friend of Bosnia and Herzegovina and its people. Uh, let me to remind you, Ambassador Aria uh, was permanent representative of the state of Venezuela in the United Nations 
when the president of Security Council in March 1993, uh, that was the time when uh, aggression happened, aggression the committee over Bosnia and Herzegovina and the uh, genocide over its people. Uh, let me recall you, uh, I was agent of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, before International Court, Court of Justice in genocide case Bosnia and Herzegovina against Serbia uh, in period 2002-2006 I was preparing for oral hearing uh, my legal uh, team and, and me noticed testimony of Ambassador Arya uh, testimony before International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in Milosevic case. Uh, Ambassador Arya observed that Serbian authorities were aware of commissioned genocide at the time of the commission of genocide. It was key point of our case uh, that was just what we tried to prove. Uh, subject of debate before the International Court of Justice were two questions. Uh, first, uh, whether Serbia <coughs> was an accomplice in commission of the genocide, and second one, uh, whether Serbian authorities were aware of commission of the genocide at the time of the commission of genocide. Uh, we uh, produce this another uh, evidences and the court uh, passed the judgment in 2007. Uh, the judgment has a little sense. Uh, the court ruled that uh, Serbia was uh, responsible for uh, commission for uh, not preventing genocide in which it, it, it didn't participate. Or and uh, which it was uh, not aware of. It has really little sense. Uh, I am not, I am not uh, an expert in international relations. I believe Mr. Arya, Ambassador Arya, is, I would like to put him one question. Uh, why is the judgment such as it is? Thank you. Professor, I will answer you in, in a few words, because I remember the case perfectly well. Bosnia and Segovia was a perfect crime. Everybody recognized it was a crime, but nobody was responsible. Well, then, Mr. Sabre, thank you very much, Ambassador. It's a very clear answer. Uh, it's only taken only for your stuff, Ambassador, in Italy. I am uh, Kenan Šindegović. I'm a third year law student. Uh, and first and foremost, it is a great honor, and I feel very humbled to even ask a question in the company of our professors, and especially you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, my question is somewhat related to your lecture. Uh, the first time I heard about you and your efforts was when I re researched about declaring Srebrenica a safe haven and it was later declared into a safe zone, safe area, I apologize, which is a com completely different thing. Uh, at that time, was it pretty obvious, blatantly obvious, that the international community would lift no finger with the exception of the United States, which was somewhat of a later response in 1995? But more relevant, to this time, does that kind of sentiment that we have no support even today lives on, and how we should stance ourselves and and fight and fight against such stance that we have no help coming? If I can uh, express myself like that, thank you. I could not understand why well your question. I'm sorry. Uh, at the time of. In the 90s, uh, the international community did absolutely nothing 
to prevent a horrendous act which happened in the Srebrenica. Uh, and does that sentiment still lives on today that pretty much no one cares from the international community what might transpire in the future and what might occur in, in, in our country? Thank you. Now I understand you perfectly well. Uh, by the way, you, know, you said it correctly. Safe and protected areas are two different things. And basically, I would like to address this to the students. The semantics plays a very important role in international relations. I was the one who presented the, the safe area to solution. In Spanish, I call them zonas protegidas. The Americans translated them to safe areas. The French, zones de sécurité. Little did I know at the time that safe meant nothing. Protected meant too much. Protected actually means that you have to act. The United Nations forces were not called unsafe. No, they were all unperformed because there was, it was make misleading the public opinion that they were there to protect. No, they were not there to protect as you know how this war ended at the first part. And uh, you, you are absolutely correct. And, and at that time, not only the semantics, the international community was already in the attitude that Bosnia uh, could never come out as a victim. Because Milosevic, to many of them, represented the stability in the Balkans. Milosevic played with the international community during five or six years. He really played them. He was extremely able, or we were extremely weak. The same thing with Tushman. Tushman forced the international community to respect him. In our case here, the international community thought that Isabelovich was an old Muslim fanatic. And they behaved with him in that way, in the most disrespectful way. I still can hear a discussion that had with Lord Owen, Security Council, when referring to Isabelovich, he said, and him, and him. And I said, what do you mean with him? Isabelovich, no, it's not Isabelovich. The ninja is Isabelovich the president of the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So i just give you this uh, remembrance to show you how the world, the international community, actually behave in that respect. Thank you, yes. Thank you, sir. Volta, thank you, Roshas Turbenauta. Thanks, Presto, to please introduce yourself. My name is Haris Darman. Uh, I'm 19 and I just finished uh, high school here in Sarajevo. It's my honor and pleasure to, to speak to you and hear you speak uh, in person. Uh, I, have a, I have a big interest in global politics and in the in work of the international community, etc. And uh, I just want to ask you a question. Uh, we witnessed that uh, in 1990s, the world didn't lift a finger, they turned a blind eye on what was happening here. Uh, the, here is happening, and you know also, a fascism, clear fascism, uh, genocide, and etc. Uh, but their uh, fear of Islam was greater than its recognition of, of, of fascism uh, at that time. But today, uh, with the Russian aggression in Ukraine, the situation has changed and I think it's not because Europe loves us or the world uh, just because of its own interests they need to secure this uh, this uh, this area and uh, and wipe out the Russian malicious activities and because of that I think that we can and we have a perspective in EU and NATO integrations and my question is uh, we have witnessed that at that time, uh, 
Europe's Islamophobia was great and then it's anti fascism Is the same situation today? Or, it, uh, or has that changed knowing uh, the Russian aggression on Ukraine and etc.? I, I think much. it's a very valid point. You are very wise in, in indicating that. that uh, Thank you. It's not because they love you, it's because they need you. Yeah, That's what definitely. you said. But uh, the, the picture that was created for so many years, the image, the false image of this country, like a center of radical Muslims, which is absolutely false, I believe that is still predominant. And one, one of the reasons why I believe that is that they, they keep uh, like a, a, a school teacher to make sure that the kids behave properly, which is the higher representative. Uh, and to make who indicates what can be done. This morning I was very disrespectful with the rector when I said to him, well, even the high representative could fire you, could fire anybody in the political system, in the institution. And that to me is something that should be changed. To me, it's not a matter only of uh, cleaning a little bit the constitution, or there's so many constitutions that you have. To me, it's a replacement of a system that allows Bosnia and Herzegovina to be what it is today still in the United Nations. The only member recognized by the United Nations is not Serbska, it's not the Federation, it's the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Perhaps some other questions, please. Introduce yourself. Your Excellency, I'm Larry Kurkovic, I'm student in the third year faculty of Law University of Sarajevo. It's a great honor to ask you a question and to be here to listen to your lectures. Uh, my question uh, is related on a book of Guillaume Ansel. It's called A uh, Cold Wind Upon Sarajevo. And he was a, a soldier of uh, forces from French Legion. Uh, stationed at the airport at Sarajevo in UN forces and he talked in one part of his book about Srebrenica and he's saying that uh, at one noon he was looking at those photos that NATO planes took every two hours over Srebrenica and he saw there uh, that they are photographing, photographing genocide happening in front of their eyes I mean it was really hard for me to even read about this and uh, I, I want to ask you, what is your opinion about uh, the statement that uh, even the cost of lives of French soldiers are not enough to act by NATO planes at this time? You know, the, uh, the last time that I saw the Vice President manage during the war, oh, sorry, August 1993, he was at the door of the government building, saying goodbye to me, and the plane passed by. And he said, they are defending our human rights and, 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 and watching our, the human rights violation, which is uh, something absolutely cynical. But it was true, exactly what you said. And uh, the point of the French, I could not understand. Uh, th those people that were in UN forces, those were uh, French soldiers from French Legion. Yeah, uh, foreign legion, and this man who was Guillaume Ansel, who wrote this book, he was responsible for navigating the NATO plans, planes to act in uh, those situations, and he even uh, numbered it like a few hundred times that he wanted to act, but they didn't respond. Well, now, you know, it's very easy to say, I, was, I wanted to do this, they didn't allow me, the problem was to have said that at the moment. That's what, that's what I said this morning to you, that when I entered the Security Council, I said, maybe one day I will write a book, my experience here. But I would not say, like many diplomats, I wish I had said this, I should have said that, I should have done that. I did it, everything that I had in my heart and my mind, and I felt lost my obligation at the time. Timing, it's very important in this case. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And <coughs> excuse me. Uh, 
excuse me, Mr. Ambassador, Professor Zinka Gerbo. She is a dean of the law faculty, faculty of law of the University of Sarajevo. Thank you, Professor Sarajevo, for your kind introduction. Uh, dear Ambassador Aria, thank you very much for your speech. Thank you for paying us a visit here. At the university, thank you for uh, your objectivity, but first of all, thank you for uh, being honest. And thank you for being uh, Don Diego de Sarajevo. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to, I, oh, well, I, I would uh, kindly ask you to give us uh, your short overview or your impression on the uh, different approach, if any, when it comes to the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina during the 90s and the one we are seeing now in Ukraine from the point of view of the uh, international community. Thank you. Hello, Professor Adin. The situation, of course, is completely different. The, the time of the greatest witness, the time of what's happening over. At the time when the authorities here believe, rightly so, believe that the international community would help them if they saw that the country was invaded them. Because that's what the Charter of the United Nations states. And you can say they were too innocent. Well, they were not only too innocent, they read the Charter and they thought that this would happen. Today, I believe, is stronger in a way but weaker. Because at the time, the Republic of Bosnia and Herzegovina, even though the, the United Nations had divided into an apartheid, because that's it's a strong word, but it's an apartheid where you cannot use a hospital if you're in Bajaluka and to come here, or you have two schools under the same roof. That's called apartheid. And uh, that makes to me uh, very difficult to charter a course if you really want to be, as you know, a sovereign country. That's my, 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 my <clears throat> we can go deeper into that for a long time, but how to compare both situations for me, really. When it comes to the question of the refugees, do you think the, 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 the international community? Are you mean of the positive refugees? Yes, and, and, and the one from Ukraine, you know? Well, uh, as you know. I mean, just in general, like. You know, in my country, we have seven million refugees in the last seven years without a war. And we are a country of 30 million people. <coughs> the treatment of the refugees is becoming a major issue. Not only in Europe. Take a look at what's happening in the border of the United States with Mexico. And you see Latin Americans trying to revive the river, etc. It's a very difficult. I don't know if you want my opinion how the international government behaves. Beha behaves in that sense it will never be fine because the local populations do not like immigrants in general they, uh, even though it's been proven that uh, immigration is very important from an economic and social point of view for some nations in general people do not like other people's coming in it, 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 it's not only here it is. They're from the same domain. Yeah. yeah. That's why it will be easier. Yeah. Thank you. I'm not going to take much of your time anymore. You know, I, uh, we uh, I wrote an article in Los Angeles Times called Haiti the Black Bosnians. And I said, why do I say that? Because we, the Latin Americans, in general, said, well, the Haitians are black. They don't speak Spanish, they speak French. They are no Latin American. And here, suddenly, the British and the French maybe said, they are not Europeans. They are Muslims. Okay, so that, that was the question. <laughs> the, the, the answer is Thank you. Thank you very much. Ambassador, yeah, I'm Dijalo Alachuyan, our student. If our student, please introduce yourself. Greetings, professors. Mr. Diego Aria. I'm a student here at the College of Criminal Sex, Criminology, and Security Studies. 
I have a question for you, be rather short, or a direct one. Uh, God forbid, if a similar situation happened today in this day and age, in how this? in this day and age, how would how do you think the international community would react? Or if the situation was different in the nineties, in the nineties, how do you think um, if if you could take the time back, would you change anything? We don't do it will forecast. I believe that I hope that lessons have been learned. Uh, these lessons were not learned in the treatment of Ukraine. Uh, so I hope that here, I think one of the students asked me for he understands the, 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 the issue with Putin. I speak more of Putin than of Russia, like I speak more of it also than of the Serbs, uh, because of, they are the main parties. That's the only can tell you about that. Thank you very much. I just wanted to say uh, hello and uh, thank you very much for your uh, extremely impressive lecture. I'm coming from Institute for Research of Crimes Against Humanity and International Law. And uh, I just want to, uh, also to thank you for your activities uh, in 1992 and 1993 in the Security Council. Uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, this is really so important. Uh, and I just want to ask you about uh, um, discussions uh, uh, in 1992 in the Security Council about uh, 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 those terms, safe area, protect area, uh, and uh, uh, safe heavens. Uh, and the uh, difference between uh, uh, those terms because uh, uh, I think it is so important that our, our people from Bosnia and Herzegovina um, uh, actually uh, know uh, differences between uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, uh, so important, uh, um, it, uh, it is not protective area. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it is so important, important to, uh, to know, know those people from Bosnia and Herzegovina. And thank you very much because uh, uh, you are here uh, with uh, your lecture and teaching uh, about that. Uh, and um, uh, I just want to actually to ask, uh, in 1992, all, uh, all uh, um, uh, discuss uh, uh, from Security Council about safe area and uh, refugee crisis, uh, uh, and uh, refugees from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, uh, and uh, I just want to say that uh, security uh, zones uh, or a safe area uh, in 1992 uh, want to uh, show uh, that uh, uh, people from Bosnia and Herzegovina should be there. Uh, stay uh, in uh, um, their homes, uh, and uh, uh, that's the reason because a safe area should be uh, uh, actually declared. Uh, and in 1993, uh, safe area was uh, prevalent, um, and I just want to ask you about uh, uh, differences uh, uh, about uh, resolution in 1990, uh, 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 actually 1890, uh, and 80. Uh, uh, and I, uh, between uh, the resolutions uh, in April and May and the June, June uh, about the security, uh, about safe areas. I'll try to put together your Maybe it's a uh, big, big question, but um, no, uh, I'm really interested. Yes. I'll try yes. to address mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. There was uh, an officer of the United Nations, a civilian. I think it was a monster, one of the safe areas. And he put a, a sign saying, danger, warning, you're entering a safe area. <laughs> yes. That's it. Uh, <laughs> Господин Амбасадор ще вручити книгу, господин Декану и една книга за нашу библиотеку. Дозволите, господин Декане, може да се запази за 
<laughs> it exists. <laughs> Thank you very much.